In Mecca is beyond belief the holy city in Islam has been swarmed by a catastrophic plague of locusts during the holy month of Ramadan. Terrible, Kaaba was surrounded by strange insects. The whole world was shocked Mecca is an indispensable name in the life of Muslims. This place is considered the holiest place and the place where the largest activity is held is the Hajj pilgrimage. However, in recent days Mecca is not simply famous for what it was but the whole world is buzzing with news about the events taking place in the Kaaba. This event made Muslims constantly worry about a dark future. Strange insects have launched a general attack on this sacred place. Horrifying scenes are constantly being updated causing the whole world to pay attention to this city. Is this created by the hand of God? Is God trying to send a secret message to Muslims? Let's dive into today's video to find out the right answer. But before we start, don't forget to spend a few seconds to subscribe and follow us so you don't miss any news from us. And now without wasting any time, let's get started. An extraordinary event at one of Islam's holiest sites Mecca in Saudi Arabia has taken place during the Ramadan rains. The Grand Mosque was besieged by a massive swarm of locusts. This occurrence greatly disturbed the worshippers and compelled the authorities to embark on a large-scale cleaning operation. Swarms of desert locusts invaded the holy city of Mecca while millions of them landed on Mecca Tower's clock to completely hide it from people's view. The Saudi Environment Department took timely action and immediately destroyed the locusts. Videos posted to social media showed the insects swarming around cleaners and worshippers in the city's Grand Mosque where millions of Muslim pilgrims congregate every year. This event has left Muslims confused and searching for the true origin of this phenomenon. Locusts appear in the Bible, usually when God is disciplining his people or issuing a judgment. While they are also mentioned as food and we know the prophet, John the Baptist was known to have subsisted in the wilderness on locusts and wild honey. Most mentions of locusts in the Bible are during times of God's wrath poured out either as discipline for his people or as a means of demonstrating his power so as to move those who defy him to repentance. Locusts are grasshopper-like insects who are generally solitary. In some countries, they are a source of protein, boiled with salt or roasted to a tasty crunch. They can go unnoticed in their solitary state for months except by children who marvel at the strength of their legs and their ability to jump to impressive heights. But under certain conditions, locusts can swarm, becoming a frighteningly destructive agent of crop devastation. In this swarming phase, usually brought on by drought, they breed rapidly and travel in large clouds, consuming all vegetation in their path. Locust swarms appear in our times, especially in Africa, India, and the Middle East, although they're not completely unknown in parts of the United States. According to the BBC, in 2020, locust swarms appeared in dozens of countries at once. When they impact several neighboring countries in this way, we refer to this as a plague of locusts. Locust swarms are featured in the Old Testament, figuring prominently in the history of the Jewish people. They also appear as essential figures in biblical prophecy both in the Old Testament and in Revelation. What is the role of locusts in the Bible? Most famously, locusts played a starring role when Moses took on Pharaoh in Egypt. One of the ten plagues Moses called down upon the Egyptians was locusts. The Israelites had been enslaved for generations under cruel Egyptian pharaohs. In the time of Moses, it was God's plan to free them from slavery, but Pharaoh's heart was hard. God used the ten plagues. They are blood, frogs, gnats or lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn of Egyptian people to move Pharaoh's heart to free the Israelites. God turned their water to blood and filled the land with frogs and biting gnats. The people endured and Pharaoh remained embedded in his hardness, so God sent a pestilence that killed their livestock boils that afflicted their bodies, and then hail that destroyed much of their food supply. Pharaoh was still unrelenting, so God sent locusts to eat whatever the hail had not destroyed. They were the cleanup crew focused on leaving not a twig or leaf for food for Pharaoh's people. Most famously, locusts played a starring role when Moses took on Pharaoh in Egypt. One of the ten plagues Moses called down upon the Egyptians was locusts. The Israelites had been enslaved for generations under cruel Egyptian pharaohs. In the time of Moses, it was God's plan to free them from slavery, but Pharaoh's heart was hard. God used the ten plagues, blood, frogs, gnats slash lice, flies, livestock pestilence, boils, 
hail, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn, to move Pharaoh's heart to free the Israelites. God turned their water to blood and filled the land with frogs and biting gnats. The people endured and Pharaoh remained embedded in his hardness, so God sent a pestilence that killed their livestock, boils that afflicted their bodies, and then hail that destroyed much of their food supply. Pharaoh was still unrelenting, so God sent locusts to eat whatever the hail had not destroyed. They were the cleanup crew focused on leaving not a twig or leaf for food for Pharaoh's people. Locust in Revelation, God's demonstration of plagues against Pharaoh, as dramatic as it was, was only a precursor or foreshadowing of what is to come at the end of days. Revelation prophecies the time when the inhabitants remaining on earth will rise up against God. The people of God will be raptured, and deception will be rampant. Kings and nations will unite against God. God's wrath is imminent, but, just as he did with Pharaoh, God will send dramatic warning events to persuade people to repent and be saved. The locusts of Revelation, however, are no ordinary locusts. They will not be swarming against vegetation. In fact, they are instructed not to bother with the grass or trees, but to, instead, swarm against humans. They are given five months in which to torment people with pain like that of a scorpion bite. The Bible says it will be such agony that people will long for death, but not be able to find it. The locusts from Revelation 9 have unique characteristics as if they were bionic creatures, upgraded from swarming crop destroyers to great storm clouds of terror for humanity. They are, in fact, released by an angel from a great bottomless pit, or abyss, and rise like black smoke from the recesses of a place so terrible, their reigning king is an angel known as Apollyon, which means destroyer. As you can see, when locusts are mentioned in the Bible, it's worth paying attention. What will follow is likely widespread devastation and sorrow. Of course, God's desire is that this devastation and sorrow would lead to repentance. Much as we, as human parents, will increase discipline with a stubborn child, hoping each elevation of restriction brings about a change of heart so they no longer repeat their unacceptable behavior. So God increases humanity's discomfort to turn them from actions that will lead to eternal separation from Him. The terrible locusts of Revelation, as horrific as they are, pale in comparison to the second death, which is life forever without God, who is love, light, and life everlasting. God is always moving toward the day when he will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you, Joel 2 verse 25 ESV. Satan looks only to kill and to destroy. His aim is eternal death. God sends trials, including locusts, but his aim is restoration of relationship, repentance, renewal, and life eternal. It is worthwhile that we pray for those who are unsaved that God would use every hardship to soften and not harden their hearts toward the gospel. Prophecies that came true. Besides, archaeological discoveries are one that has long fascinated scholars. The ten plagues are no exception, and over the years scientists have been curious about whether the story of the plagues may have been based on some event that can be proved to have happened. Here are three of the major theories to know. Outstanding are the following. Volcanic eruption. This theory argues that the plagues were really the fallout of a volcanic eruption on the island of Santorini in the south of Greece around 1620 to 1600 BCE. Microbiologist Ciro Trevisanato, author of The Plagues of Egypt, Archaeology, History, and Science Look at the Bible, argues that ancient Egyptian medical texts support this idea. Winds would have carried the volcanic ash to Egypt at some point over the summer, and the toxic acids in the volcanic ash would have included the mineral cinnabar, which could have been capable of turning a river a blood-like red color, Trevisanato holds. The accumulated acidity in the water would have caused frogs to leap out and search for clean water. Insects would have burrowed eggs in the bodies of dead animals and human survivors, which generated larvae and then adult insects. Then, the volcanic ash in the atmosphere would have affected the weather, with acid rain landing on people's skin, which in turn caused boils. The grass would have been contaminated, poisoning the animals that ate it. The humidity from the rain and the subsequent hail would have created optimal conditions for locusts to thrive. Volcanic eruptions could also explain the several days of darkness which means nine plagues are accounted for. 
Trevisanato also found an ancient Egyptian account of the children of aristocrats lying dead in public and archaeological data matching the account. He believes that, amid all this destruction, firstborn children could have been sacrificed out of desperation in the hopes that such a meaningful sacrifice would lead their gods to stop punishing them. Red Algae This theory was put forth by scientists like John S. Marr, an epidemiologist who wrote a 1996 journal article featured in the New York Times argues that red algae could have sucked oxygen out of Egypt's waterways, killed the fish, and turned the water red. Just as in the volcano theory, frogs then leapt out looking for food and died. Without frogs to eat the insects, the pests proliferated and feasted on corpses, a feeding frenzy for flies and locusts. The paper argued that the lice could have been a type of insect called culicoids, which can carry two diseases that could explain the livestock deaths, African horse sickness and blue the boils on humans could have been caused by glanders, an airborne bacterial disease spread by flies or tainted meat. In this theory, the darkness is coincidentally caused by a sandstorm. The darkness would have left the crops well, whatever crops were left after the other problems moldy, and the mold could have produced airborne toxins that might explain widespread childhood death. Climate change. This addendum to the algae theory points out that, for red algae to flourish in the first place, there needs to be slow, sludgy, warm water. In 2010, research on stalagmites, elongated mineral deposits that form out of calcium in precipitation, suggested that there had been a dry period towards the end of the rule of Pharaoh Ramses II. That change would have dried up the Nile and significantly slowed down the flow of water, according to paleoclimatologist Augusto Mangini. These conditions are ripe for the growth of the bacterium oscillatoria rubescens, more colloquially, burgundy blood algae, according to biologist Stefan Flugmacher. But ask someone who's celebrating Passover, and they're likely to say that the question of whether scientists can prove the plagues really happened in ancient history is irrelevant to the holiday. To me, it doesn't matter whether scientists are able to find a historical basis for something that happened around 3,500 years ago. The central message is that God brought the plagues on Egypt in order to free the Israelite slaves, says Jerusalem-based Rabbi Yonatan Nero. God was teaching the ancient Egyptians the lesson about justice, he says, and when they refused to do the right thing and free the Israelites, they suffered the consequences. However, Nero, as the co-founder and executive director of the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development, to say that science has a key role to play in how the story of the plagues is told and received today. That's because he sees another lesson in it, one for the era of man-made climate change. The pollution of ancient Egypt's water echoes water pollution and water scarcity issues today. Frogs, with their very sensitive skin, are an indicator species, meaning that their suffering is seen by scientists as a marker of a larger imbalance in society around them. And to narrow, the parallels don't stop there. The Egyptians were very happy to have a free source of labor in the form of Israelite slaves. When God said this needs to stop, they were reluctant to change, he says. Fossil fuels, in the past 150 years, have replaced slave labor as the key driver of human society. There's a pharaoh within us that wants to continue to do something that's not right. The second coming of God. The aforementioned phenomenons are also a sign of God's second coming in the Bible. In fact, Jesus promised his disciples that he would come again. John 14 verses 1 to 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When is Jesus coming back? Jesus will come back soon. However, no one knows the exact time when Jesus is coming again. Mark 13 verse 32 says, But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Interestingly, the disciples asked Jesus the same question just before he returned to heaven. At that time, Jesus told them it was not for them to know the times or seasons which are in the Father's authority. Therefore, Jesus may come back tomorrow, next month, next year, or 100 years from now. So what does this mean for you and me? Always be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Watch and focus on Jesus because the devil is seeking to distract mankind from understanding the signs and closeness of Jesus' coming. How will Jesus come back? We know Jesus' second coming will be a literal event and will be just like he went to heaven the first time. Acts 1 verses 9 to 11 says the following. 
Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Why is Jesus coming back? The Bible says that Jesus is coming back to reward the inhabitants of the earth and bring many back to heaven with him. Revelation 22 verse 12. The Bible also says in Matthew 25 verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus, more than anything, wants to spend time with you. He invites you to return to heaven with him to enjoy an eternity with no more tears, pain, or suffering. What would keep you from accepting the invitation of Christ? What would keep you from putting him first in your life? What would be more important than saying, I want to pattern my life after Jesus and soon live with him forever? What happens to the righteous at the second coming? At Jesus' second coming, the righteous dead will be raised to life and taken up to heaven along with the righteous who are still alive on the earth. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. To be ready for the second return, we need to be prepared. Develop our spiritual aspect. Deepening your relationship with God. This involves regular prayer, Bible study, worship, and living a life that aligns with Christian teachings. Cultivating Christian virtues. This includes characteristics like love, forgiveness, compassion, humility, and service to others. Self-reflection and repentance. Honestly acknowledging your shortcomings and seeking forgiveness and growth. Living in anticipation. Maintaining hope and joy while recognizing the uncertainties surrounding the timing of the second coming. The practical thing you should do now, sharing your faith, witnessing to others, and spreading the message of Jesus. Supporting the church, actively participating in church life, and contributing to its mission. Serving your community, engaging in acts of love and service to those in need. Living responsibly, managing your resources wisely, and being mindful of your impact on the world. Taking care of yourself, maintaining physical and mental well-being to be prepared for whatever the future holds. Things to remember, yes, focus on the present. While preparing for the future is important, don't neglect your responsibilities and relationships in the present. Avoid speculation. Don't fixate on specific dates or interpretations of prophetic passages. Embrace uncertainty. The timing and nature of the second coming are ultimately unknown. So focus on living your faith faithfully. Seek guidance. Consult with trusted spiritual leaders and study scripture for further insights. Ultimately, preparing for the return of Jesus is about aligning your life with his teachings and living each day to the fullest, filled with hope and faith. It's a personal journey, and the specific steps you take will depend on your individual beliefs and circumstances. I encourage you to explore these concepts further through personal study, prayer, and discussions with fellow believers. Remember, the most important thing is to live a life that reflects Christ's love and teachings. Thanks for watching the video. Subscribe to our channel for more related videos.